The following was recorded live at Pop Tech 2018. Thank you. So, if you are looking to have a more innovative organization, I've got good news for you. I have the secret science of innovation right here on a napkin. It was given to me at a conference run by an organization called the International Association of Innovation Professionals. Did you know there was such an organization? And these are consultants who come together to learn what they call the science of innovation, which is apparently, in some mystical way, a combination of social science, hard science, and business, and the magic science of innovation is in the middle. Now, I went to their conference, which is called InnovaCon, in March, trying to learn more. And I'm a journalist, I'm a bit of a skeptic, and this is an organization that runs professional certifications. They have webinars to teach about innovation. And you know, I'm from the world of tech, where things are moving quickly, and sometimes I think it's not this easy. So I have made it a bit of a personal quest to try and understand what this mystical thing called innovation is. Because everywhere we go, somebody is claiming an innovation. At the Consumer Electronics Show in January in Las Vegas, it was the innovative underpants that block radiation. <laughs> we are funding. Venture capitalists are putting large amounts of money into companies that claim to be innovative. You may have seen there was a company called Quirky that raised $185 million to make crowdsourced inventions that were innovative, such as the smart milk jug called the Milkmaid that had sensors in it that knew when your milk was starting to go sour and sent you an urgent notification so you would quit work that afternoon to go home and change your milk. And um, you may have also seen, if you're one of those people obsessed about the freshness of your eggs, they sold the $50 smart egg tray, which would then send you real-time updates on which eggs were not as fresh as they should be. Quirky, sadly, went out of business, as did a company which has raised $120 million to provide the world's most innovative juicer. It's called Juiceru. $700 this juicing machine, full of internet sensors and Bluetooth and wireless. And you had to buy these refills, um, which all worked really well until journalists at Bloomberg decided that you could squeeze the refills by hand and you didn't need the 700 juicer at all. And sadly, Juiceru, as an innovator, is no longer there. <laughs> and I kind of realized that everywhere somebody is trying to create an edge by innovating. I saw the first drone with robot arms, and I couldn't work out if this was now the way to take your children to school, <laughs> or maybe a way to abduct children from school. So we need to stop with this obsession, innovation, and think about what it actually we need to make our organizations kind of healthy for the way things are going tomorrow. Because as The Onion found, it is a bit of a cult, and we're not really thinking through. And it's not something that I think we've realized we're walking into. I've started to notice how many streets on Street View are named in honor of this emerging cult religion. Companies are incubating startups in innovation units. A yogurt company is incubating startups. A company that makes aeroplanes is incubating startups, which worries me because I travel on a lot of aeroplanes. Um, <laughs> often it's theater, though. It's ticking a box. It's, you know, we have appointed a chief innovation officer. We're fine. We have a unit in another building that does innovation. That's fine. And I haven't seen anything that's come out of this because Technology, consumer behavior is changing so fast that if you carry on with today's approach, today's mindset, today's business model, you're going to become irrelevant. It's a bit like Wiley Coyote being chased by a roadrunner off the cliff. Keeps running until he realizes, actually, the reality has changed. And it's not money that solves this problem. It's clever approaches by mission-driven leaders who know what they're doing. Last Friday, I was in um, this classroom in Lima, in Peru. And the classroom is interesting. It's a new kind of school called Innova Schools that are owned by one of the biggest corporations in Peru. Um, it was started by this gentleman, Jorge Suski, who ran a successful engineering company. And then in his mid-40s, he decided, we have a problem in Peru. The middle class is not rising quickly. We're at the bottom of all educational attainment league tables we need to step in. So he started 
low-cost private schools, went to the best educators in the world, went to Berkeley, went to Harvard, MIT, created online courses to help teachers, and sold it to a big corporation quite early on. A corporation called Intercor, which has about 4% of the GDP of Peru. It owns banks, it owns cinemas, it owns supermarkets and pharmacies. And Intercor, which was started by this gentleman, Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, in 1990, its mission is, as well as building a successful business, bring Peru up with that business. Because it realizes if it needs customers in the future, it's going to have to have people who are materially better equipped to buy their products. If it's going to have staff, talent, it's going to have people who are better educated. So CRP, as he's known, has now invested $600 million in education. They've scaled up in other schools to 49 schools. They've started moving to Mexico. He's built a technical university to try and be the MIT of Peru. And that's just the first step. They're about to open the first private health clinics. They have a pharmacy chain. Well, the government's not solving health. Let's do that. And after that, they've worked with IDEO. They have a lab prototyping new kind of businesses. They're trying to solve connectivity in the vast areas of Peru that are poor. And it's driven for a purpose, as well as business. These are all for-profit companies within Intercor to make Peru the best place in Latin America to raise a family. That is what I call real innovation. And the reason this is important is because every company is now facing this moment. This is the homepage of a bank, HSBC, that's been annotated by CB Insights to show for every link on the homepage, some of the startups trying to eat the lunch of that bank. And this is banking, I can show you the same for media, for retail, for food delivery. And it's not necessarily big bucks that solve things. So you've probably seen these videos by Magic Leap, a company that raised $2.3 billion to create a mixed reality headset that when it came out in the summer um, received mixed reviews. I was in Tel Aviv in February. I saw a company that's so bad at hyping their story. This is the entirety of content I found on its website. It's called iWay. It's raised a small amount of money. It put these glasses on me, projecting using lasers ahead of my eye, tracking my retina. It was amazing. And it made me think, you don't need now permission to be the innovator. You certainly don't need huge funding. You just need an understanding of where technology and consumer behavior is taking you. And it's moving quickly, so you can't rest. Um, we're putting these spy devices in our homes, in our offices. But scientifically, this was impossible just a couple of decades ago. 1994, Microsoft launches a project to teach the network how to understand human voice. The first year, complete failure. Five years ago, got it down to about a quarter. Last year, they said, this is now as good as human. We're there. So if you're running any kind of business that talks to consumers, can you afford to ignore the voice way of interacting. If you are following what Amazon's doing with its retail stores, Amazon Go, using computer vision, algorithms, sensors, they're reportedly planning 3,000 of these. If you're another kind of retailer and you blink, well, this is going to educate consumers to expect a much more friction-free journey. So data, science, Moore's law, all, all these are coming together to force everybody in every kind of organization to think, whoa, so where do we go? Data is everywhere. Even this business, the wine business. There is now a startup in San Francisco called Ava Winery that is reverse engineering the molecular structure of wine, of whiskey, taking the gas, taking the liquid content, and making up their version of wine, not using grapes, but using plant molecules. This is a company that offends people in France. You don't want to tell French people about it. They get very upset. But I'm thinking now, if wine is now reduced to a data problem to solve, then pretty much every business is. So in my journey, I've been looking for organizations that are trying to do bold things. I'll give you some of the things I've learned. Um, I went to Helsinki. A bank, the biggest bank in Finland, started in 1891. It realized it's been commodified. Startups are doing a lot of the things that the bank has been doing. So it's thought, we have to reframe our value. So it's a company that's owned by its member customers. And they thought, well, we've always been here to help people through difficult bits of their life, buying their first home, borrowing money to, buy a, to set up a business. Um, how do we stay relevant in a way that is not commodified? Health is important. They're now building five private hospitals in Finland, and the bank is performing surgery. And because it's doing it from scratch more efficiently, 
it's created an insurance product, a health insurance product, that is lower cost than most of the others. 10% of the profits of the bank come from lending money to people to buy cars. They figured in 15 years people won't buy cars, they'll buy access to the autonomous network of cars. Well, let's get into mobility as a service. The bank's app now lets you rent a car by the minute. That is what I call innovation. And it doesn't have to be a big organization. There's a bookshop in the most expensive area of London, Haywood Hill Books, that's been there since the 1930s. You would think it's not an easy time to run a bookshop, and it's true. So they've decided to reframe the value. Rather than being experts in selling books, they've decided to be experts in curating collections of books. They now run a service that will make a bespoke library for you, they did a 3,000 book library for a wealthy Swiss individual in her mountain chalet. They charged her 500,000 pounds. They've also now created a subscription business, but a human algorithm. There are five women who work in the basement reading books all the time, and they get to know you personally and send you one book a month gift wrapped. It costs about 400 pound a year, and they've got thousands of people subscribing. It's a very, very personalized, very tailored service with something for everyone, whether you read a lot and you want really obscure things, or whether you just want to get a little bit more into books, um, and we can point you in the right direction. I want Eleanor's job, reading 200 books a year and getting paid for it. So every sector has these people thinking in fresh ways. Uh, the biggest airline in Australia, Qantas, again, a century-old business. It's not great being an airline. You don't control your costs. You're competing with the low-cost carriers. They decided after a couple of very bad years that maybe the true value is not in the airline, but it's in something connected with it, the loyalty program. Qantas loyalty is, unlike most airline loyalty programs, um, much more embedded in Australians' lives. Half of Australia is a member. You spend and earn points when you go to the supermarket, when you go to a bar. And they realized they had this emotional connection, this trust with their members. So they thought, why don't we build new kind of businesses on top? Next to the headquarters, just behind the airport in Sydney, they have a warehouse building with 150 people inside. Designers, lean startups, developers, um, anthropologists, and they're prototyping new kind of businesses on the back of the loyalty program. So far, they've created a health insurance business, a life insurance business, a food and drink club, new kind of credit cards. This year, it's 30% of the revenue of the company. It's projected within five years to be the biggest part of the business. That is what I call innovation. Or you can create an ecosystem outside your organization so there's mutual benefit. This is Lei Jun, who founded a company in Beijing that makes smartphones and other devices called Xiaomi. And um, he's often been kind of mockingly compared with Steve Jobs. He once made the mistake of wearing a black turtleneck at a keynote and using the phrase one more thing. And certainly the phones have been compared as with you know, copycat versions of Apple phones. I'm not going to comment about the look of the Xiaomi stores. But he's actually doing something really interesting. In China, you make no margin on the handsets. It's so competitive. They have invested small amounts of money in up to 400 accessory startups, mostly hardware startups, and told them, we'll give you access to our 300 million customers. We'll give you access to our supply chain. In exchange, we want our logo and your product and most of the profits. And the ecosystem they built is amazing. It's defensible. It's helping take Xiaomi into the next decade. Um, the best-selling battery packs and air purifiers in China are showing me. And I went to ask the team who were making these investment decisions. I said, I don't understand, your hardware, why don't you make these products yourself? And they kind of smiled and said, well, we'd have to have twice as many people in the company. We'd never make a decision. Plus, we'd rather these people making the hardware knew on the streets what people wanted a day rather than yesterday. So we put them on the cover of Wired saying it's time to copy China. Sometimes it's not private companies, it's governments that are doing amazing things, building ecosystems. Um, this is Tallinn, the capital of a little country in northeastern Europe called Estonia, 1.3 million people, and it was Soviet-controlled, Soviet-occupied till 1991, and they became one of the first digitally first countries. Everybody has a digital ID card. This gentleman, Kaspar Korgis, is now running a unit inside the government dealing with what he calls e-residency. Anybody outside Estonia can apply online, 20-minute form to fill in, put 100 euros in, and you can become a digital resident of Estonia without physically going there. You get a little identity card, and you can set up a company trading in Estonia, which is in the Eurozone. And suddenly, you're getting people from Ukraine, from India, setting up companies to trade. And the beautiful thing is, it's incremental revenue. 
And he's got a vision that when you get to 10 million e-residents, he says, we can do away with the tax system. You don't charge income tax, you charge a subscription fee, 100 euros a person. And we want to be a platform like an app store on which other governments can offer services aimed at our community. This is a country. They're even talking about doing their own cryptocurrency. This is bold. This is innovation. One of the approaches I'm seeing a lot that seems to work is removing the hierarchy with the boss at the top making all the decisions and empowering the team. And this is the head of one of the most successful games companies in the world, also in Helsinki. It's called Supercell. This is Ilka Pananen. You've probably played some of his games. He wants to be the least powerful CEO in the world. That's what he says. And the structure of Supercell is lots of little cells, four to 18 people who have complete autonomy. And I went to see them and there was um, one of the games designers who had been working, leading a team of 10, for 10 months on a game, and they tested it, and they worked on the App Store in Canada, and they weren't entirely happy with how things were going. So he called the team together and said, you know, let's go and have a sauna and discuss this, as they do in Finland. And they decided there and then to kill the game after all the investment and to find other things to work on. Emailed the company, didn't tell the boss. The boss wasn't in the office that day, didn't think they need to. This is why they attract talent that feels empowered. There's another example of this, um, happened in the Poshest Hotel in London, Claridge's Hotel, which is in Mayfair. They wanted to expand, they couldn't buy neighboring buildings, they couldn't build up, so they wanted five stories underground. And the owners have been trying for 10 years to get this done. No engineer would take it on, because they had two rules. Number one, we can't close the hotel, we don't want to lose the customers. And number two, the only way you can get in or out is a single window, two meters by two meters at the back. The impossible project, it was called. Until a team of structural engineers, based in London, 15,000 engineers in the world, owned by a trust in which all the staff have ownership. They thought, well, this is a nice challenge. Let's see if we can get enough people together who are excited by the project and want to do it. And they solved it. They've just built the fourth underground floor and they did it by thinking creatively. They brought in miners from Donegal in Ireland to tunnel 62 long tubes, fill it with concrete, and they're now supporting the entire hotel on this. And it's only because it was at the bottom people had the power to get excited that they managed to think in this fresh, creative, innovative way. So I'm quite interested in how you can get the culture of a place to encourage innovation. Um, at Google's X division, where they've come up with projects like the self-driving car, Waymo, and Loon, which is spun off as a business, internet connectivity at stratosphere level. They're obsessed with creating the protocols to give people what they call psychological safety, to take big risks, and if they fail, it's fine. One of the people there, Kathy Hannon, was obsessed with, could you take seawater and turn it into a sustainable fuel? And one of the things they do at X is force you, at the beginning, to come up with kill criteria, Metrics at which you will kill your project even if you're really attached to it. And so for Kathy's project, the kill criterion was it will only work if we can make fuel at no more than about $5 a gallon, so we're competing with the gas station. And so she worked for two years, built up a team, gradually met targets, got more people in. Price comes down from about $1,000 a gallon, $30, and then she killed the project. Went to the boss and said, that's it. And they all got bonuses because it was going to take longer and cost more to get down to $5. And it was about using people's time and resources more efficiently. And it's giving people this freedom to work that I think is bold. Some of the things that X has done haven't been great commercial successes, but you know, Waymo has been valued at up to $175 billion. It's a cultural phenomenon. And the physical way you get people to interact can be helpful. Tony Shea who built up Zappos to a company that Amazon bought for a billion dollars, um, is obsessed with this, and he works in offices like this. He wants to create a party atmosphere where people kind of collide and new ideas happen. And um, he moved the staff to the downtown part of Las Vegas, which was fairly low rent, and is currently trying to convert it into a cluster of creativity. The mission, he's putting $350 million of his own money, buying land, investing in startups, creating restaurants. It's not entirely succeeding. It's become a bit of a real estate play, but his goal is fascinating. He wants to bring what he calls the three C's together, collisions, co-learning, and connectedness in an urban environment. 
And like many people in the West Coast, he's a, very obsessed with the Burning Man idea that you get 70,000 people together in the desert for a week, building a city, a gift economy, a non-cash economy, a creative expression economy, and they work together in fresh ways. I don't think you'd have companies like Airbnb were it not for this kind of experimentation, which is why I'm really interested in kind of workspaces which design collaboration, serendipity. Um, the biggest, well, my favorite new building in London, the Crick Institute next to St. Pancras, is the biggest biomedical research center in Europe, trying to solve cancer, funded by the cancer research charity, the universities, the Wellcome Trust. And it's got no walls on the inside because it was designed so that the biochemist mixes with the physicist, mixes with the data scientist, and finds new approaches to solving this problem. Technology is emerging and grabbing it early can lead to innovation. I was in two weeks ago in Napa in this barn and a vineyard with half a dozen Michelin chefs who were employed by the biggest manufacturer of pots and pans for the American market, a Hong Kong company called Mayer, started by this gentleman, Stanley Cheng, in his 70s. His son, who's 36, says, Dad, the internet's gonna change pots and pans too. We need to be there. People are gonna have sensors in their pan soon helping them cook, guided cooking. He agreed to create in his vineyard, this barn with chefs, designing recipes for an iPad app. There's a sensor inside the new pan. It heats up precisely for as many seconds, induction heating. I asked him how big he thinks this is gonna be. He said, well, it's either gonna be a billion dollars or zero, but if we're not experimenting, we're dead anyway. And again, the emerging technology, there's a company making fertilizer in Norway the biggest fertilizer company in Europe, had a problem, had to truck 50,000 truckloads of the fertilizer to the port every year. It's just spent $40 million making a prototype electric autonomous cargo ship. This is a trial one. Suddenly, the rest of Norway is calling them up saying, can we use your electric autonomous cargo ship? This is potentially a new billion dollar business line because they were using an emerging technology to solve the problem. And I guess lastly, I'm going to leave you with an opportunity when things go wrong. So I was in Mumbai. There's a company called Wellspun that makes one in five towels and sheets sold in the United States. And they had a problem a couple of years ago. The company Target announced that Wellspun 100% Egyptian cotton sheets were not really Egyptian cotton. We're not going to stock them anymore. Big scandal. Share price goes from 112 rupees to 40 something rupees. Big existential question. Does it survive? And they thought the only way back is to prove that we are the most transparent company about our supply chain. So they started going to the fields and tracking using RFID tags, bales of cotton, to create what they called WellTrack. Now there's a QR code on your label that you can use to see exactly where your cotton came. It's a new business opportunity. So finally, what have I learned from all this? If you want to be a true innovator. I guess ownership is important. Don't rely on the public markets. Ideally be owned by a family, founders, your customers, your members. Um, number two, your leadership must be aligned. Number three, they must empower the team. You must look at emerging technologies and data and see how you can rethink. Ideally have values and purpose beyond profit and think long term because this is an opportunity to build the companies of the future. And if that doesn't work for you, you can always join the Pirates at the International Association of Innovation Professionals who are going to have a webinar anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you. For more information, visit poptech.org.